Hello everyone, this is update for March 13, 2024, day 749 of the war and of the date update. Uh, also catch up for March uh, 12 and 11. Um, I'm gonna start today with actually a little bit different topic and specifically military economics. And I'm gonna, gonna go over two examples and, um, and then explain uh, why there is desperate need for demonopoliz demonopolization uh, in the military industrial complex in the West or simply West will not be able to win um, the war against uh, the opposing alliance um, and not because uh, you know there is shortage of equipment or simply because it cannot afford financially uh, and and it is it's it, it also means shortage actually of equipment uh, if things gonna remain the way they are so let's take uh, let's take example of the artillery shells uh, uh, so uh, you well not really Ukraine but um, uh, sponsors of Ukraine are purchasing uh, eight hundred thousand shells um, from allegedly Bulgaria uh, for. Uh, I believe like 1.5 billion euros. Uh, it is, I think, 300,000, 122 millimeters, which is Soviet, and 100, the rest is 155 millimeters, which is Western standard. Uh, just for simplicity purposes, we'll just take blended and assume it's 155, uh, sort of kind of like make it even more favorable um, uh, for the West, the calculations. But so, um, so the ever so the uh, the price average price per shell uh, comes to about two thousand uh, US dollars. This is for one fifty. Let's assume one fifty five millimeter. Uh, this is Bulgaria, right? So it's much cheaper production base in Western Europe. In Western Europe, that really go you know starts at four thousand and really uh, more like five six seven and and up to the 8,000 per shell. So it's basically each shell is, is uh, it costs a fortune. Um, for Russia, it's under $1,000. It's And it's probably closer somewhere between 500 and $700 uh, per shell. So as you can see, you know, let's say it's 500, right? Uh, or even 700. So it's one to three shells uh, advantage just um, there and if you take we uh, you know Western Europe, let's say, uh, it it's uh, unbelievable sort of um, advantage that Russia has. Uh, and the problem again, the reason for this is because the uh, military production is extremely monopolized uh, in you know Western Europe and U.S. is the same. There is basically a handful of um, military manufacturing companies in the U.S. and a similar situation in Europe. The only sort of more sort of better situation in Europe that uh, there are more countries, so each country has its own. Uh, so therefore, you have a little bit more. But the problem in Europe is uh, because all of the sanctions against Russian energy, it, you know, production is essentially non-competitive in Europe. It's extreme, extremely expensive. Uh, and given that manufacturing of the shells requires its uh, relatively energy intensive uh, production, so um, it's basically insanely expensive in Europe and, and simply, uh, you know, not viable at, at, in this setup. And that's that's a reason why France wanted to, you know, produce, 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 but then end up not doing anything, dropping it. Um, and, and actually blocking during all of that time for probably like year and a half or almost two years, probably like year and a half, you know, uh, purchase outside of sort of, you know, core uh, European Union. Because there, as I mentioned before, there are there are shells on the market. They're not made in the European Union. But the, the reason they're not made because it's, it's not viable to make... Um, any equipment, military equipment in the European Union under current uh, sort of um, economic and, and energy policy. That's what really makes it impossible. Um, so this is uh, one example. Is another example uh, is uh, we'll take uh, Russian 
uh, UAV drones, uh, Shahid 136. So this is Russia calls this, call, calls them uh, Heran 2. Um, and basically you see those like white or now they have black ones. Uh, basically triangle wings with propeller and, and basically warhead and so they cost twenty thousand dollars each roughly um, so Ukraine was supplies supplied with the rockets so there are Hydra 70 rockets they are uh, old outdated um, and you know US company don't recall, don't recall the name, uh, basically uh, uh, put uh, uh, the module there to base to make it uh, um, guide, to turn it into guided, basically into guided missile. So this module costs like $40,000, which is, uh, I would say, insane price because it's you know, it's effectively a computer, right? And it's actually it's actually very primitive computer. The the cost of the of the you know computer equipment there is probably like five hundred dollars. Uh, the rest is is basically monopoly. Well, there should be pro profit. There's no question about it. But uh, the rest is monopoly premium. And then if you really think now, you have this rocket and it it shuts down this Shahid hundred thirty six. So you exchange forty thousand for twenty thousand. So Russia can simply sit and send those, um, you know, twenty thousands, and you go bankrupt because you spent forty thousand to destroy twenty thousand. So I think the equation is extremely straightforward. Uh, this is um, uh, there is no way to to win the war uh, from that perspective. And, and and again, this goes back to monopolization. Uh, extreme monopolization and um, and there really the answer is extreme demonopolization because you know let's say Ukraine does not survive um, you know West will have to face uh, China Russia Iran uh, regardless and and if there is this problem with uh, cost of manufacturing this really means that there will be not enough equipment and uh, you basically losing from the get-go you, you, you shouldn't even start the war because it's very clear uh, you just it just uh, the outcome is predetermined from the very beginning without even starting the war um, and um, going back to the actually this alliance um, I just want to mention that um, uh, Russia Iran and China had uh, joined um, military drills in the the uh, navy uh, and uh, uh, russian president made uh, had this uh, had an interview uh, i think one of the uh, probably hopefully helpful uh, for understanding what russia wants is the message was very clear so uh, the russian president described West as vampires, and he literally says, and he was very clear that uh, the the age of vampires is coming to the end. So this is for those, uh, you know, I guess individuals who believe that somehow Russia could be pulled out of the alliance with China and Iran and so on. This is uh, the interests there are extremely, I would say, interconnected and. Um, there is much more vested interest than anything that West can offer uh, to Russia, including even uh, Ukraine. It's not going to sway Russia. The, Russia is pretty determined at this uh, at this point. So um, now, having said that, I'm going to switch to the situation on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, uh, also, want to make another comment. Uh, the uh, the Ukrainian military command uh, started doing actually something that's sensible uh, and specifically attacking uh, Russian um, uh, energy producing infrastructure and also uh, not infrastructure but uh, energy producing facilities specifically refineries uh, and that's really um, 
you know taking toll on Russian uh, economy because the gasoline price started to go starting to go up so uh, it really does have a fact this is something that's actually um, a very reasonable idea that actually can uh, yield uh, good results in the long run it's not a short term it requires consistency uh, and determination uh, and remains to be seen if um, Ukrainian um, military command will will be uh, persistent uh, in executing these goals uh, because uh, it's nearly impossible for Russia to defend all of those oil refineries there's just way too many uh, they too scattered and everything so um, it's um, just putting anti-air defense around each of them is is essentially not practical there's there's going to be always holes that can be exploited essentially which means that uh there's always can be damage done uh to russian um refineries specifically there's another part that was also within the same idea is uh, attacking russian uh, manufacturers of commodities specifically steel and iron ore um, those are really backbones of russian economy along with obviously with uh, oil and, and uh, processed uh, crude oil products such as gasoline diesel fuel those are backbones that uh, really bring revenue bring us dollars and euros which is what russian government needs uh, to russia and and they really feed the whole effort and so uh, this is one of the you know right moves finally after two years of the war that uh, Ukrainian command started um, uh, started doing. Uh, the not so wise moves are this uh, stunts or shows where Ukrainian military command is trying to attack Russia territory. It uh, fails completely in miserable way, wasting resources, um, abs ab absolute absolutely disastrous idea, and, and execution is even worse. Um, and then the most important it's again it's a waste of uh waste of resources precious resources that ukraine does not have uh left much um now i'm gonna oh and then one uh, last item so ukraine president stated that uh situation uh, stabilized on the front line and things are sort of getting better and the sun is starting to shine and so on uh which is uh, completely opposite from the truth uh, things uh, appear to be stable because it's a natural process where uh, Russian troops they attack uh, they eventually this leads to attrition of Ukrainian uh, 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 defenders so basically fewer and fewer soldiers remaining per uh, kilometer of the front line uh, because you know pe you, people wounded people get killed and so uh, and uh, there's not enough replacements and so eventually the, the it becomes very thin line and then eventually it crashes under russian pressure without even uh you know huge pressure it just crashes because just simply not enough resources per kilometer of the front line uh and this is this is the process that we are naturally going through right now so it's a it's sort of like lul before the storm and it's uh it's not because things are under control it's just natural nature of the process and this is being um, you know actively misrepresented by ukraine president as things are under control which is uh completely false um and we're probably gonna see um sort of uh more lost territories in not so distant future there's even right now uh, there are small losses and i'll, I'll, I'll mention that but uh, but it, it, it could be that there could be significant uh, collapse on the front line and, and, and there could be a really disastrous outcome not not Im imminent but uh, if things they, they go the way that they are uh, there will be a sort of disastrous uh, wake-up call uh, for Ukraine as a society uh, okay now I'm gonna ask, do a walk through it in a clockwise fashion starting from very north so the situation along the state border remains more or less the same with the exception of this uh, as i said the ukrainian stand that's completely 
um, senseless doesn't make any sense but nevertheless uh, the, the this is i'm sure was driven by ukrainian president and his desire for shows uh, now let's move to the situation on the uh, north Luhansk front line uh, things here relatively quiet uh, on the weaker side though uh, russian uh, command resumed their attacks in direct towards kupiansk they still probing fairly weak uh, nevertheless, there is sort of resumption of activity there. Uh, now let's move to the uh, North and Bus front line. Uh, Northern sector is always uh, fairly quiet. Not much to say there. Uh, the Southern is, um, things are getting sort of slowly worse uh, for uh, Ukrainian side. So um, uh, Russian troops continuing their attacks west of Bakhmut. Um, it's Actually, unclear if Ukrainian troops are still able to hold on to Ivanivsky. So, uh, if even if they do, totally on outskirts and probably in by the next video, it will be completely lost. Uh, the more important is, uh, and this is not hundred percent confirmed, but it looks like Russian troops managed to breach all the way to this channel, so which is pretty deep. Uh, uh, big penetration as you can as you can see especially for this war given like how this war is world war one this is pretty big advance and pretty big bridge um i'll provide details more as i have uh, it's obviously not like operational bridge but nevertheless it signifies um how worn out ukrainian defenses are and and they start to sort of uh, really collapsing in uh, in in relatively big way. Uh, now let's move uh, south. So let's see what's going on on the central um, Donbass front line. Uh, things here remain more or less the same, exception that uh, Ukrainian side uh, lost uh, uh, the village Nevelske, which is around this area. It's pretty small. But the importance is that that was very good tactical position. Uh, and it seems like it was just lost for what I said, that uh, there is simply attrition. There is not enough people on, on the front line. And it's lost not truly in a you know fierce fighting for the village, but because just simply not enough troops. And they just withdrew and, and the village is lost. Uh, and that's um, really the big picture of what's happening. Uh, just want to mention, uh, probably for people who are new, uh, that uh, Ukraine is actually nominally has nine hundred thousand people in the army, in the in the in the uh, military forces. Um, actually, on the front line, only roughly three hundred thousand, like three hundred thirty thousand. So, whereas others are six hundred thousand, nobody really knows. And at the same time. Uh, Ukrainian uh, government continues to catch, you know, people on the streets while there are like 600,000 people in the army. It's like a black hole and nobody, you know, I would say not that they are unaccounted. This is, um, you know, this is effectively, I would say, dodging the military service by actually being sort of nominally in the military units but actually not being there so it's it's um, it's a complete uh, fraud uh, there but th that's a problem um, uh, in ukrainian government that they cannot even manage effectively resources that they have because 900,000 is eat plenty uh, russia has roughly 600,000. so as, uh, there should not be shortage. Ukraine still has advantage in the manpower, nominally, obviously. But in reality, uh, as you can see, the real sort of balance of power is 600 versus 300,000. And obviously, uh, that's um, you know, not favorable for Ukraine. And especially if Ukrainian command is extremely rigid and unable to move reserves and so on so then russian side can exploit those th those situations uh now let's uh, uh discuss situation here around marinka uh so far no big advances just small advances straight west in the village Georgievka, but that's more like uh, i don't know 100 200 meters 
so far it's nothing worth mentioning there in in meaningful way but the trend is obviously the same as as i mentioned is um um ukrainian army is on the retreating side uh now let's look at the zaporizhia front line uh russian forces uh, resume their activity here a little bit but it's still very subdued very sort of probing weak uh more just to keep this um you know ukrainian troops engaged and not being moved somewhere else that's probably more like a purpose of all of this activity here um, now let's move to the last section of the front line along the Dnipro River. Uh, things here again, the same idea, pretty weak uh, attempts, um, really just to keep pressure uh, is very clear, um, no um, desire by Russian command to destroy this, uh, this bridgehead near Krynki simply because it's really expensive to do those, to do so. And as I mentioned before, uh, Russian command actually, you know, they don't have enough spare troops. They have enough to basically attack in in couple of locations, and even there, uh, you know, uh, they cannot sustain extremely high level of pressure for a long time. Then it goes into sort of slower mode, and then eventually it, res you know, then it eventually it's kind of like a wave. Uh, then it's going to go a little bit higher. Uh, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye bye.